Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you, Jacques and uh, Marie, for the uh, invitation and the organization of this uh, workshop. Very pleased to be back here uh, for the second time. Um, I would like to um, remind you some key messages from the uh, last IPCC report, the uh, fifth assessment report. Of course, link that to the results, some of the results of COP21. Uh, and then talk just a little bit about what's next. But what's next is, is the whole week um, discussion. So I'll be very short on, on the, the third part. Key IPCC me messages. Well, you might wonder, the IPCC has published reports for 26 years already. First report was published in 1990 first report warning of global warming induced climate change and uh, basically say this climate change thing could be a problem. And the second report came five years later, climate change definitely a problem. Uh, 2001, yes, we should really be getting on with sorting out this, this pretty soon, you know. 2007, the year the IPCC got the Nobel Peace Prize. Looks sorry to sound like a broken record here, but 2013, we really have checked and we are not making this up. So you can extrapolate and wonder, is, 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 this, is this microphone working? <laughs> so the IPCC has said things for a long time, and many of the uh, conclusions uh, that the IPCC came with have actually been there uh, from the first IPCC report, unfortunately. It took a very long time uh, to get through the minds of uh, policy makers and decision makers. The three main questions the IPCC is trying to answer are the following. What is happening in the climate system? What are the risks? And, of course, what can be done? I have too many slides, I know but you will have all of them on my webpage and I'm sure the uh, workshop webpage afterwards. So I, have an attempt I made an attempt to summarize the 6,000 pages of the last report in one slide. <laughs> Human influence on the climate system is clear. There's no ambiguity there, no, no probability number, no adjective. <laughs> it's clear. Second key message, continued emissions of greenhouse gases will increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and in many cases irreversible uh, impacts for both people and ecosystems, with a common rule, unfortunately, that it's usually the poor people who are affected uh, first. Third key message, while climate change is a threat to sustainable development, there are many opportunities to integrate mitigation measures, adaptation measures, but also the pursuit of other societal objectives, which is very important uh, in the framework of um, decision-making. In a nutshell, humanity has, the present tense is used, has the means to limit climate change and at the same time to build a more sustainable and resilient future. Now, I won't be very long about this, but just a reminder, if you average the uh, global temperature decade by decade over the last 150 years, this is what you get, with successively the last three decades becoming warmer than each preceding one. The last 30-year period for which we have uh, relevant statistics in the Northern Hemisphere is likely the warmest of the last 1,400 years, so it's, it's a very clear uh, situation. It's not only the average which is changing, it's also the frequency and sometimes the intensity of extreme events such as heat waves and heavy precipitation events. And since the middle of the 20th century, this has increased in uh, many locations. Glaciers are melting. Look at this one, for example, in Alaska as it was in 1961. And uh, look at from the same viewpoint 42 years later, what is remaining from that glacier. And this is the behavior of most glaciers in the world. I go back and you see it's uh, water. This contributes to the uh, sea level uh, rise. 
uh, which has been 20 centimeters uh, globally approximately over the last 100 years. It's one of the factors increasing sea levels, the other, one, the other ones being um, thermal expansion of water and the melting of the big ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, which unfortunately uh, has started. Why is all this happening? Well, it's now very clear that it is mostly, at least since the middle of the 20th century, because of this increase here. This is the increase. Uh, this, this was the reason Al Gore needed uh, a crane in his movie, for those of you who have seen An Inconvenient Truth, to follow the huge increase in the CO2 concentration after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And as you see, that concentration for the last almost one million year has been oscillating naturally between 200 and 300 ppm parts per million. But we are now at 400, uh, a value uh, never seen over the last 800,000 years at least. Now the IPCC report by report, and you can see the evolution up to the last version here, has been clearer and clearer uh, in the explanation of this temperature trend here. Uh, the blue curve shows the results of simulation, climate simulations, uh, model simulations, using only natural factors. And as you can see, after 1950 or so, it, it doesn't, doesn't cut it. It doesn't work to, to reproduce the, the warming. The reddish curve uh, comes from climate simulations done with, of course, natural factors again, but also, in that case, human factors and greenhouse gas emissions in particular. And this led uh, to the increasing confidence and to the conclusion uh, in the last IPCC report, a, a assessment report number five, that it's extremely likely, a probability more uh, higher than 95%, uh, that human influence has been the dominant cause of the warming since 1950. should be clear that it's not any time, but since 1950. Now, why is this CO2 concentration increasing? Because we have succeeded, uh, we, humanity, have succeeded uh, in disturbing this uh, delicate carbon cycle, which had been in perfect balance almost for the last 10,000 years. So before disruption by human activities, mostly the burning of fossil fuels and also through deforestation. This is how the fluxes looked like at the global scale and these are the numbers for the last decade of the 20th century. You have emissions and the numbers are in gigatons of carbon per year for the fluxes. Emissions by vegetation and soil respiration and organic matter decomposition of a little less than 120 gigatons, but absorption by photosynthesis of the same amount. In the oceans, in the cold, sorry, in the warm part of the oceans, emissions of approximately 70 gigatons per year. Absorption mostly in the colder part of the oceans because CO2 dissolves better in cold water. That's one of the main factors to explain the difference. Uh, absorption of the same quantity. If you sum up what's going up, it's 190, and it's exactly what's absorbed on a yearly basis, 190. So that amount, which is the pre-industrial amount, 600 gigatons per year, uh, 600 gigatons, sorry, the stock of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of CO2, had been stable for the last 10,000 years. But it's increasing as... Uh, you have seen by approximately 1.5 to 2 ppm uh, per year. And this is because, uh, and again, these are the numbers for the last decade of the 20th century, uh, we are emitting a total of 8 gigaton per year, mostly through fossil fuel burning, of which a little less than half accumulates year after year in the atmosphere. So we really, we really have a stock pollution problem, not a flow pollution like noise is. It's a stock that's increasing year after year. The stock of, of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of CO2 increases. Why is it only a smallish half of what's emitted? 
because the ecosystems and the oceans render us a huge service, free service, of absorbing uh, some of what we emit. Um, but uh, this, these amounts uh, may not uh, remain at those values in, in the future. So without any climate model, without any difficult uh, calculations, you can understand that a first order of magnitude of the reduction that would be needed just to avoid uh, an increase in the thickness of the CO2 layer around the planet uh, is to divide emissions by, let's say, two. You don't need any climate model to do that, to, to see that, because then you would hopefully balance the emissions and the absorptions. Actually, this is totally wrong. It's, it's an order of magnitude, so it's okay as a first cut, but it's actually not enough because, of course, if you, de if you deforest, you, de you destroy the amount of sink that can absorb carbon. If you heat water, you decrease, uh, you, you increase uh, the amount of water that can emit CO2 and you decrease the amount of the ocean, the amount of ocean that can absorb CO2. Etc. Etc. So for several reasons, uh, it's actually needed to um, stabilize the warming to go, as we will see later, to zero emissions as quickly as possible. Not divide them by two, but go much further. The carbon cycle and understanding the carbon cycle is actually very important. I didn't spend much time on those diagrams. I can spend half an hour on them. I won't do that today. Uh, we don't have the time, but it's very important because um, the, um, uh, it, it's behind, for example, the historical responsibility of developed countries uh, because of that accumulation uh, process taking place in the atmosphere. So it means past emissions matter for a long time. It's actually computed that about 40% of the emissions uh, we, we have today will still present, will still be present in the atmosphere in a thousand years from now. So the inertia in the carbon cycle is, is very large. And it's also the, the main, one of the main reasons in the carbon cycle why the, um, the carbon budget uh, for uh, staying under a warming of 1.5 or 2 degrees in the future <coughs> is so limited and why the window of opportunity is closing so fast. We'll come back to that later. Now, we're actually not uh, decreasing emissions uh, at all. Over the last 50 years, as you can see, the increase in emissions, mostly due to fossil fuel um, usage, has been huge. Now, looking at the future, the IPCC used uh, scenarios uh, to um, study the, the, uh, the plausible or the possible evolution of climate uh, you com using climate models uh, again, but towards the future this time. So the four key scenarios used are the following. Uh, the top one is, a, is a, um, a kind of business as usual scenario, baseline scenario, which doesn't stabilize before uh, the 22nd century at the earliest. And this, is, this scenario is very much the scenario on which up to now, we are. The three other scenarios called respectively from bottom to, to, to this one, RCP 2.6, and you'll hear this, <coughs> this name, this complicated name many times, to RCP 6. And the top one, uh, the business as usual one, is the RCP 8.5. Um, RCP stands for the Representative Concentration Pathways. And the numbers actually I can say that to a bunch of physicists, e even if they're not only physicists, I hope the economists can understand that as well. Uh, the, uh, those numbers are for the radiative force, the additional radiative forcing uh, at, the, um, at the top of the uh, troposphere uh, in 2100. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an amount of heating, if you, an intensity of heating by um, surface area. So RCP 2.6 stabilizes the concentration of CO2 
uh, at approximately the present value, 400 ppm. After a peak, slightly higher, and then there's a decrease later. While the top scenario, for example, gets you to more than 1,500 ppm um, in the coming uh, century. Now, when you feed those um, scenarios to the uh, climate models, these are the, these, are, these are the temperature curves that you get. And only the two extremes are shown here, but for the um, last 20 years of the century, the averages are shown here for the four scenarios. As you can see, only the bottom one, the RCP 2.6, uh, is able to maintain uh, the uh, temperature at the end of the century below the uh, two degree limit that has been decided in Copenhagen uh, in 2009 and confirmed in Paris a few months ago, at least with at least a 66 person probability. Now, the baseline scenario, the RCP 8.5, uh, is associated to a warming that's approximately four to five degrees uh, above the present temperature, that's uh, five, to six temp five to six degrees above pre-industrial, because we have gained already one degree uh, Celsius uh, since the pre-industrial period. And you might think, this is not so much. Where's the problem? Why, why wouldn't it be nice to have a few more degrees at the planetary uh, level? Well, to understand that it might not be so nice, have, look, have a look at this, which I've shown two years ago, uh, but not everybody was there. Uh, and I think it's very important to, uh, to see those pictures, those, this slide and the next one. This was how the planet looked like 20,000 years ago at the peak of the last glaci glaciation with a huge ice sheet on North America and on Northern Europe and Scandinavia. There was so much ice there a uh, nice sheath uh, two to three kilometers thick in some places, that sea level was 120 meters lower than today. There was so much water stored there that uh, it was, um, uh, sea level was much lower. Now, why am I showing you this? Because the difference in global average temperature between that planet and the planet we know today, this one, is only four to five degrees. And it took about 5,000 years to gain those four to five degrees. Now we're talking about gaining, in the worst case, four to six degrees, not in 5,000 years, but in 100 years. And of course, the habitability of the planet could change in a similar way. Of course, it's not the same. We don't have ice sheet, etc., in the same, the same manner. But it's just to, to point to the fact that uh, global temperatures are really uh, indices that, that can uh, represent, if they change, huge changes in the habitability of the planet. Of course, this increase in temperature is distributed in space. You see here for the lower scenario, for the higher scenario by the end of the century, and for example, you see that it's significantly higher over continents than over the oceans, which have a higher thermal inertia. It's also higher in, in uh, the Arctic, in particular, because you have local amplification uh, mechanism at work. There are also changes in the precipitation patterns, uh, changes which are very clear in the higher scenario, which, for example, uh, significant drying in the Mediterranean basin and si significant uh, wetting uh, in, uh, in the northern part of Europe, for example. But you also have um, uh, drying in, in part of uh, Australia, drying in South America, drying in uh, um, significant parts of North and South America. So big changes in the hydrological cycle. You can zoom there, but we don't have the time to look at all the details. Sea level would, of course, continue to increase by 30 centimeters to one meter, depending on the scenario and also the, the sensitivity of the model you consider. Uh, one meter. Uh, or even half a meter would uh, mean big uh, problems for the more than 10 million people, for example, living in the Nile Delta. Uh, you see the red zone here, the red uh, area there is uh, the area which is at less than one meter above sea level, and it's uh, where more than 10 million people are living, cultivating, etc. So impacts of climate change 
are already underway uh, from the tropics to the poles uh, on all continents and also in the ocean. I didn't speak about uh, the ocean acidification problem, but it's also a problem associated to the CO2 that's absorbed by the ocean uh, and which acidifies the water, which is creating uh, a, a long list of problems in the uh, ocean ecosystems. Impacts affecting rich and poor, but as I said before, the poor are more vulnerable everywhere. A few examples of categories of impacts. Food and water shortages, increased displacement of people. Uh, think about the, uh, uh, the drought in Syria, which for several years uh, created recently difficulties in agriculture in that region, and which is one of the factors, not the only factor, obviously, but one of the factors uh, explaining uh, the uh, present uh, mig migration crisis uh, from Syria. Increased poverty, <coughs> coastal flooding, with something to, rem to remember always that uh, the risk is not, always a, it's not only a question of the uh, geophysical <laughs> hazard itself, but that it's a combination of three factors, the hazard, the vulnerability, and as you can imagine, this black handicapped person in the street of New Orle Orleans 10 years ago at the time of Katrina is particularly vulnerable and much more than someone who could uh, leave the city in a car. Uh, and exposure, which is the amount of infrastructure of the size of the populations exposed to, to the risk. In, the fr in front of all those uh, impacts and potential impacts, uh, adaptation is already occurring. I mean, there are many efforts, for example, here, uh, children planting mangroves to try to um, increase the resilience against uh, waves um, that become higher with increased sea level. Uh, in Bangladesh, people building on um, uh, elevated um, terrain, uh, refu refuge for a tropical cyclone, etc. Uh, so adaptation measures such as those, just give two examples, can decrease, um, can decrease the uh, amount of risk uh, for different climate situations. So look at the caption here, this, what this diagram shows for Africa in, in three, in three, for three important sectors, water, food security, and diseases transported by vectors such as mosquitoes. This is, for, this is the risk level from very low to very high for present, near term, until 2040. Long term climate, uh, in, if the temperature is um, stabilized at no more than 2 degrees, and for the last um, line uh, with a maximum temperature of 4 degrees. What is striped here is the amount of increased risk that can be reduced by adaptation measures following the assessment by the IPCC authors in the last report. And just have a look at this one, food security in Africa. For a two degree world, the uh, risk can be cut by two until uh, medium risk, not to zero, but until medium risk from almost very high. But in a four degree world, the amount of risk that can be reduced by adaptation is extremely limited. So adaptation is useful, but it, it definitely needs to be combined with mitigation. As we know that the risks of climate change increase uh, with increasing temperature and the IPCC has attempted to summarize those risks in, in different categories here. We don't have the time to look at each of them, but for example, uh, this one, take this one, is the uh, category related to extreme weather events, heat waves, floods, etc. And as you can see, you, you, you have the color scale here, the increased risk, additional risk to climate change. Uh, when you enter the 1.5 to 2 degree zone here, uh, use this temperature scale where the zero is with pre-industrial, uh, you, you, you enter, at least for the, the first two uh, categories, you enter the region of high to very high risk. So there, there is every reason to try to stay on this scenario rather, uh, to, uh, try to, to, to be on that scenario rather than to stay on this one. Now, to appreciate the difficulty of doing that, 
It's important to uh, have a look at another diagram in the last IPCC report, which is a diagram showing the almost linear relationship between the cumulative total anthropogenic CO2 emissions since the end of the uh, 19th century and the warming relative, relative to the same, the same period. And as you can see, until 2010, it was almost linear. Okay? 18, 1890, 1950, 1980, 2000, 2010. And uh, the climate simulations done with the four scenarios I've shown you for the future, with dozens of climate models, have all shown, uh, of course, with some uh, uncertainty um, region, that that linear, almost linear relationship uh, between the cumulative emissions uh, and the warming stands. Why is it so important? Yes. Uh, it, it might be because of um, the, the amount of um, sulfur and aerosol sent uh, at that time, uh, which exerted a cooling, a cooling factor. Uh, but as sulfur uh, was a, um, a reason to have acid, acid rain and, and severe air pollution uh, in many countries, measures were, were taken to remove sulfur from much fossil fuels before burning uh, and, uh, or before the fumes get to the atmosphere. Uh, so uh, those, uh, th they were removed. I mean, the, 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 the sulfur uh, decreased again. Uh, it, it's probably the main factor. Now, why is this diagram so important to understand the context in which the Paris Agreement takes place? Because it shows that if humanity wants to stay, for example, below 2 degrees, with a certain probability, of course you can decide uh, whether you, you want to look at this model or this model, or take somewhere um, in the middle, let's take something uh, in the middle here, uh, there is a maximum amount, and I invite you to look at this scale, which is the one given in gigaton of CO2. The other one is given in gigaton of carbon here, but we'll use this one later. The maximum amount of CO2 that can be emitted, total, cumulative total, since the end of the 19th century, is no more than a little less than 3,000 billion tons of CO2. And if you go further to the right uh, and, and have more than this amount, you inevitably uh, have higher temperatures at the global scale. If you want to stay below 1.5 degrees, of course, it's, it's a lower amount, etc. So this is what be, what's behind this idea, this concept of a carbon budget. I said a little less than 3,000. This is the result of a computation, a quantitative evaluation, with that 66% probability to stay below 2 degrees. By the way, think about what this probability means. I mean, when you have a, a target you really want to achieve in life, <laughs> in business, wherever, do you really take such a probability? i let you think about that. But unfortunately, this is the highest number the IPCC uh, published for that number. And if you have understood what we're talking about, which I'm sure you have, you understand that with a higher probability, this number would be lower. OK, but let's work with this one. So the total carbon budget, remembering uh, that it is with this probability, to stay below 2 degrees, and again, if it was to stay below 1.5, it would be even smaller. Fine, big number. Wonderful. But we have used already, we have emitted already almost two-thirds of that, and this was until 2011. So what was remaining then, at the time of the uh, IPCC report, and this part of the report was published in September 2013, based on literature published in 2012 probably, 
remaining, a, a nice round number, but this number is not there again because we emit approximately 40 gigaton of CO2 per year. So of course, this is not 1,000 anymore. This is more like 800 or something like that. <coughs> now, you could say 800, fine. Let's make a very simple scenario. We're talking about scenarios here, isn't it? Very simple scenario. We emit 40 per year. We, are, we have 1,000. Well, 25 years. We emit during 25 years. And that's fine. Well, that's a scenario where you go to zero from one day to the next after the 25 years. It's not a very clever scenario, is it? So the IPCC authors have uh, designed something better, which is this range of scenario. Uh, for different stabilized concentration of CO2 equivalent, because there are other gases than CO2, even though CO2 is the main one. And the range, the family of scenario getting you to approximately not warming more than two degrees uh, allows you to use uh, fossil fuel a little longer than 25 years because you, you peak and then you decrease and actually, you, you, you reach zero emissions and even negative emissions. Uh, and Robert uh, will, will speak more about negative emissions in his uh, talk in, in, in a few minutes. Negative emissions towards the end of the century. So you see the challenge in terms of CO2 is much more than reducing emissions by a factor of two. Still, the working group three of IPCC, uh, the one dealing with mitigation, concluded that it was technically and <coughs> eco economically uh, feasible to keep the warming below two degrees, but that uh, the scenario uh, allowing that were characterized by rapid improvement of energy efficiency and a near quadrupling of the share of low carbon energy supply, renewables, nuclear, fossil, and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage so that it reaches 60% by 2050. Of course, for 1.5, it's even more. The list of mitigation measures, but you have 1,500 uh, pages about that. Just have a look at the, uh, what it means in terms of changes in investment patterns, for example, for the next 20 years until 2029. Uh, huge increase in energy efficiency uh, and huge decrease in the extraction of fossil fuels, for example. You have the numbers here for the, me the median points for each uh, those uh, thing, and you see the, uh, the changes in investment patterns in, in billion dollars per year, um, as shown here, with increase for those four and decrease for, for those two. Uh, delaying mitigation, uh, each time you delay mitigation, you continue uh, thickening that CO2 layer and making the problem more difficult. So there are possibilities to um, be rather on this, this RCP 2.6 world than in this one where life would be much more difficult for hundreds of millions of people. So the hidden message of the IPCC report is that it is possible, uh, but if it's possible and everybody sees that not enough is happening, what is missing? Well, it's not written in the IPCC report, but it's written with invisible ink. What's, what's um, missing is political will at the appropriate scale. And for a long time, that political will at the appropriate scale, namely the international scale, uh, was uh, lacking, as uh, shown here by a sculpture by the, um, um, I believe it is Spanish um, artist, uh, Corda. So COP21. COP21 uh, was a huge uh, meeting where 196 countries were represented. It's the international meeting where uh, the largest ever number of heads of state and government met, 150, all committed, at least in their speeches, to uh, climate change. Um, and the uh, COP20, COP21 delivered uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, for which the key points are the following. Keep warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. And I, I'll have slides with quotations from the text a little later. We'll probably skip those, but you can 
read them um, when, when you, you look at the slides uh, later. But we'll just focus on the key elements here. Keep warming well below 2 degrees Celsius, but also continue all efforts to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius because it makes a difference, particularly in terms of sea level or impacts on agriculture, as Robert will, will um, uh, demonstrate uh, in a few minutes, um, to be uh, in, in this, uh, to limit the warming to this value or to that value. I mean, the increase in severity of the impacts is non-linear, so it makes a big difference between uh, being uh, under 1.5 or being under 2 degrees. Uh, but it's not only a question of having objectives, it's also uh, about the means. Uh, financial means uh, are also explicitly uh, described with uh, rich countries to provide $100 billion from 2020, uh, but it is presented as a minimum. It needs to be increased. It, it needs to increase after 2020. Uh, and an update to that number needs to be uh, decided upon in 2025. Uh, for the first time, the agreement is universal uh, with developed countries uh, who must continue to take the lead, but for the first time, all countries, including developing nations, uh, are en encouraged uh, are, and have to, to, um, uh, to, to publish plans uh, called um, national... Uh, nationally determined contributions to the global efforts to uh, contribute to, uh, to these uh, objectives. Uh, the, the need to peak uh, global emissions uh, is recognized. Unfortunately, there's no date there, but it's as soon as possible. Um, and a, a very important element uh, is that uh, from 2050, it actually say, the text actually says the second half of the 21st century, um, uh, one needs to achieve a balance between emissions uh, from human activities and the amounts captured by, by things. So uh, the carbon cycle I explained earlier is important in that context. Uh, developed countries must, must provide financial resources to help developing countries, uh, but others are invited to contribute on a voluntary basis uh, also, al also. A very important element is that a review uh, is scheduled every five years, so there's a, a system to ratchet up the level of ambitions. Uh, the first review uh, must take place in 2023. And each review um, will help countries uh, to um, um, raise their level of ambitions. These are the elements of text, I promised, but uh, we'll skip that and not read that in detail here. You see here on this map all the countries which had, by the end of the Paris meeting, submitted uh, those nat nationally determined contributions, a plan uh, to achieve uh, some kind of climate targets in the context of that 2 degree and 1.5 thing, uh, objectives. Yeah. Now, yeah. Well, non GAG target uh, means... Um, uh, it, c it can be... Um, uh, no, no, that's, no, 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 that's something. Uh, no, no, GAG is greenhouse gas. No, 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 no. GAG is greenhouse gas. Non-greenhouse gas target only. Um, it, it might, no, no, it might be adaptation only, exactly. It might be adaptation only. Some countries have uh, an INDC that's focused only on adaptation. So it's most likely that. Now, when you aggregate the effect of all those plants which had been prepared in the year before Paris, this is the result of the aggregation. How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes? Okay. Um, okay. Between, 20, between 2020 and 2030, this is the evolution that was scheduled uh, in a baseline uh, situation. Um, if you look at only the effect of the unconditional uh, climate plans that have been uh, subjected, unconditional means uh, m published by countries uh, independent of the aid they would receive, uh, from other countries to achieve part of their plan. You are here, and you, if you also include 
uh, the part of the plants which were conditional to receiving aid, basically from developed countries, you are here. In both cases, you are still much higher than the range um, uh, that is uh, compatible with the uh, pathway leaving, leading to uh, staying under two degrees. So you see, it's a first step, but there's still much work to do. Now, some have extended, and I believe they've been very optimistic. I don't believe those numbers. Um, and they've, you have heard a lot of those numbers, uh, like uh, pledges uh, associated to the INDC, the, uh, th those climate plans published before Paris, that they would lead up to 2.5 degrees, etc. For me, it doesn't mean anything. Because the temperature in 2100 doesn't depend only on what is emitted before 2030. It also depends very much on what is emitted between 2030 and the end of the century. And those climate plans don't say anything now on that. So those are extrapolations which I believe are very optimistic. I, I, I think those numbers need to be taken with a lot of caution. I think it will be much more difficult uh, than many people think. Now, an interesting point is that many INDCs are starting to put a price on carbon, as you can see here. Um, uh, domestic um, emission trading scheme and carbon taxes for this color and plant or possible use of international market mechanism for this color. So the, uh, the range of countries covered uh, is um, expanding. I'm almost done, so don't worry. I think I, I'll, I'll end it within, within the 45 minutes. What's next? Well, as Christiana Figueres, the uh, secretary of the Secretariat of the Convention said, uh, agree, getting 196 countries to uh, agree on the climate, uh, um, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, which is something that was in preparation for 20, 20 years, was the easy part. Now comes uh, the real work. And that's also what the European Commissioner, in a sense, said uh, in his uh, closing speech. Today we celebrate, tomorrow we have to act. And this is what the world expects from us. Well, it's difficult, I can tell you. I'm trying to insulate my house at the moment to decrease its carbon footprint, and it's a mess. I can tell you, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I'm also trying to increase my renewable energy input and it's difficult. Now, the good thing is, as I said, uh, the uh, Ag Paris Agreement um, schedules uh, a ratcheting up uh, mechanism already even before it will enter into force. It, it's supposed to enter into force in 2020. Uh, namely, in 2018, there'll be a, a, a facilitative dialogue, stock taking on mitigation to see where countries are at that point and to see on that basis uh, if and how by 2020 new or updated national climate plans could be submitted, etc. And there'll be a five-year a five -year cycle which is supposed to increase the level of ambition. A few words on IPCC. What will the IPCC do? The sixth assessment report has to be ready somewhere between 2019 and 2021. There are many special reports to prioritize from. There are about 30 proposals on the table uh, at the moment, including one special report requested by COP21 on the 1.5 degree C pathways, but it has not been decided yet to do any of those special reports. That will be decided in April this year at the IPCC plenary in Nairobi. The scoping process for the AR6, which is pretty important to shape the future reports, uh, and the special reports will probably take place in autumn. We are late. I mean, the IPCC is late. I have nothing to, to do with the IPCC leadership anymore, even if I were this. Um, but uh, you can expect a call for autumn nominations uh, by the beginning of next year. This is the list of all the special reports proposals. They cover many different subjects. Uh, these are the criteria to uh, select those uh, special reports just for reference. I conclude with a few um, take-home messages. The science is clearer than ever. 
urgent action is needed to maintain the warming under 2 degrees and even more uh, if humanity really wants to stay, in the long term at least, under 1.5, because I am afraid we will go above 1.5 for some points in any case. The COP21 objectives are very ambitious and challenging. There's a lot of work that remains to, to implement them. But a new momentum is there. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm, including in the economic world, to, uh, to move, in part at least of the economic world, to move in the right direction. So at this moment, scientists and the IPCC have the opportunity to serve and to be policy relevant. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested... <laughs> And if you want to know more, if you read French, you can read my book. I, it's almost sold out, and I hope it will be translated in English very soon. And I have a few copies with me. Thank you. Thank you.